So please grab your lunch and have a seat because we are about to start. And um, we don't have much time, so we cannot um, waste one minute more. Um, so let's move to, to the next session that is going to be um, about the new era of genomic testing in early stage breast cancer. Um, can I have my slides, please? So we are going to talk about how can we as breast surgeons um, and other breast cancer specialists can use the genomic testing to decide on treatment in the neoadjuvant setting. Um, okay, so the background, I don't have it in here. Okay, so the background is that there is a, a still an admin need of in some cases, what type of uh, treatment can we give to the patient? And mainly in those patients, mainly with the luminal, uh, mainly with the luminal breast cancer patients, ER positive, HER2 negative, that uh, can be candidates for preoperative systemic therapy or not. And we are debating whether to do surgery on them or not. Then, you know, in the past, we only rely on the on the pathology report, on the biologic uh, characteristics, but nowadays we have another tools that we can use to decide on which is the most beneficial treatment in this group of patients. Um, so now what we are going to talk, what we are going to hear is about how can we select patients with low risk or high risk and how can we decide on the treatment depending on their response. We, we know already that we have serial studies looking into the genomic profiling in the core needle biopsy and using the um, mamaprin, and we have seen that there is a high concordance rate um, looking into the risk when we do this uh, genomic testing in the core biopsies. I'm not gonna talk about the MINDAC trial, it's there already with a follow-up of, you know, 10 years already, and the clinical utility of mamaprin, it's already shown and demonstrated with excellent prognosis. But also I want to mention something about the molecular subtyping using the blueprint. And this is an example of how can um, the pathological um, study of a tumor can be changed when we use the molecular subtyping. And in this case, and I'm just gonna focus on the patients, on 54% of the patients that were luminal B by pathological study, but then when we do the blueprint, the molecular study shows that they were low risk. So if we just follow these patients on the, on the pathological study, we probably uh, think that they are high risk, but you know half of them will become low risk, and we will see how this will impact in the, in the treatment that we give the patients. So, we, we are going to hear about the utility of gene expression signature to guide the therapeutic decisions in the neoadjuvant setting. And we are having here the presenter, Dr. Colin Drucker. She's a surgical oncologist, breast surgeon from the NKI um, in Amsterdam, in the Netherlands. I'm not going to say the name because it's, you know, Anthony, but not the rest. Um, she has done a lot of work and research in the genomic testing and also in the screening and prevention in breast cancer. So we are very delighted to have you here, Caroline. Well, thank you, uh, Isabel, for this uh, extensive introduction on the topic. Um, well, the main challenge in preparing this, uh, this talk was to get all the novelties on the future use of genomic assays into a 10-minute presentation. So we need to dive right in. I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. So currently we are using genomic assays and at the NKI where I, I work, we are used to working with Mamaprint. Uh, we use them for women over 50 years old with early stage breast cancer and an indication for chemotherapy based on clinical guidelines. All these women are hormone receptor positive, her to have hormone receptor positive, her to negative breast cancer. So all genomic assays were initially developed uh, to guide treatment decisions in the adjuvant setting. But how about the neoadjuvant setting? To be able to use a genomic assay in the neoadjuvant setting, 
we needed to be able to trust the result from the test on the core needle biopsy that was what that was done preoperatively. And that was shown in a study that was published in the Journal of Surgical Oncology in 2021, showing that there is a very high uh, concordancy between the core needle biopsy test result and the surgical specimen test result. So that gave us the opportunity to work with mama print in the neoadjuvant setting. And in that setting, it can also guide your choice of treatment. For the high-risk patients, they are eligible for neoadjuvant chemotherapy, while for the low-risk patients, there's a choice between upfront surgery or neoadjuvant endocrine therapy. And then there's blueprint. Isabel already touched upon it, but I will get into detail later in the presentation. So to start off with the mama print high-risk patients who are eligible for neoadjuvant chemotherapy, we know, you all know, that the pathological complete response patients have a higher uh, event-free survival compared to the patients who do not have a PCR. But the probability of ach achieving a PCR for the hormone receptor positive HER2 negative patients, especially the ones with grade 1 and 2 breast cancer, is low, around 7.5%. So what happens if we look at the mama print result? Um, as you can see here in a study uh, from 2022, amongst 954 breast cancer patients, of whom 226 had hormone receptor positive HER2 negative breast cancer, and they all received neoadjuvant chemotherapy, um, you see in the, in the figure on the right that the probability of PCR um, and then the mama print index score um, below. And the lower the index score, so the more negative the index score is, the higher the probability of achieving a PCR. This image also showed us that there is a need for further stratification of risk, especially in the high-risk categories. And that's why at some point, I think it started in the ISPY trials, um, the high-risk patients were divided into two groups, the high one group, and the high two group, with the high two being the ones with the highest risk. And if we look especially at that high two group more closely, um, you can see here in a group of 214 patients uh, who are all mama print high risk, two thirds of them were classified as high risk one and one third of high risk two. And as you can see here, there's a significant difference between pathological complete response rates amongst the high two compared to the high one. So even though both mammoprint high risk groups exhibit chemosensitivity, the high two tumors have a higher chemosensitivity than the uh, high one tumors. And if we take it a little bit further uh, and, well, look, have a, a look in the future, uh, maybe this, these results can also help you guide your choice of chemotherapy regimen. Now, I'm a surgeon talking about chemo, so I have to be careful here. But amongst 212 hormone receptor positive HER2 negative breast cancer patients, all mama print high risk, um, and they compared the, key, the PCR rates compared to the regimens that were given. And for the high one, oh, I need to go back. For the high one tumors, there was no difference seen between the patients who received anthracycline, which has a lot of toxicities, uh, versus the taxane and cyclophosphamide group. There was, on the other hand, a difference for the high 2 tumors, which responded much better to the anthracycline based uh, regimens. And then blueprint. Blueprint is an AD gene molecular subtyping assay that classifies tumors as luminal, and then you have the luminal A, which are the mammoprint low risk, and the luminal Bs, who are the mammoprint high risk uh, tumors, HER2 and basal type. Blueprint results are provided with your mammoprint results, so you can always find them in the results section. If you add your blueprint to uh, your pathological classification, we see in the MRES uh, study that 23% of the patients were reclassified to a different subtype using blueprint. And most interestingly, we saw that 20% 20, 20 of the hormone receptor positive HER2 negative breast cancers turned out to be blueprint basal. And that made a difference because if you look at the entire group of hormone receptor positive HER2 negative patients and then divide them amongst luminal A, B, and basal, you see a significantly better PCR rate for the basal subtype compared to the others. 
So if we look more closely to the hormone receptor positive basal subtype, we see that they have comparable PCR rates and prognosis to triple negative breast cancer. It's a small study, sub-study from the MBRS trial, 73 patients who were blueprint basal compared to 229 triple negative breast cancers. And we see that the PCR rates are compatible and the DMFS, as you see in the image, is also comparable, especially in case of a non-PCR. Then onto the genomic low risk, the patients who are eligible for either upfront surgery or neoadjuvant endocrine therapy. Um, especially the neoadjuvant endocrine therapy is interesting because it might help downsizing the tumor, which can influence your surgical decisions. In the Z1031 trial, we already saw that there is a clinical response to neoadjuvant endocrine therapy of around 20%. So this might be interesting for us surgeons. If we look at that, um, at adding the mama print in this, these cases, in the MRAS trial, there's only a small group of patients who receive neoadjuvant endocrine therapy. Um, and in, amongst these patients, uh, the majority was luminal A, but also a, a quite large proportion was luminal B, and only several patients were HER2 or basal. As you can see in the image here, luminal A, the light blue, are the mama print low risk, versus the luminal B, who are mama print high risk. You see that a, PC, a partial response is achieved in about half of the patients and stable disease in others, but progressive disease, it was not seen very often. And if we then look at survival, this is metastasis-free survival rates, we see that the luminal A, so the moment low risk group, have an excellent survival of 91.1% in five years compared to the luminal B's, the moment print high risk, who have 75% uh, five-year distant metastasis-free survival. We also wanted to look at this in uh, our own patient population. Within the NKI, we had 72 patients with hormone receptor-positive HER2-negative breast cancer who were treated with neoadjuvant endocrine therapy based on their mama print result. And we saw a pathological partial response in 94% of the patients. Only one of them had a PCR, but still we saw a lot of response. And the most, <clears throat> the most interesting part was that 26 of the patients were eligible for mastectomy prior to their neoadjuvant endocrine therapy, but eventually 16 of them received breast conserving surgery after their neoadjuvant endocrine therapy. So that's a 60% reduction in mastectomy rates. So overall, the impact of mama print and blueprint on treatment decisions was evaluated in the determined study which is a prospective observational multicenter study um, in clinically high-risk breast cancer. So all patients included were eligible for neoadjuvant or adjuvant chemotherapy based on their clinical pathological factors. And what they saw is that 43% of the patients had a change in treatment decision based on mama print and blueprint results. And for the luminal A, so so the mama print low risk patients, this was even 95%. So the message is to take home. Genomic assays can help guide decisions in the neo adjuvant setting. Molecular subtyping using blueprint can help find the aggressive hormone receptor positive breast cancers with a higher PCR probability. Mama print high two tumors have a greater probability of a PCR compared to the high one. Patients with a high two tumors appear more likely to achieve a PCR to the anthracycline-based neoadjuvant chemotherapy compared to the high one. And neoadjuvant endocrine treatment is an option for genomic low-risk patients and may lead to more breast-conserving surgeries. Thank you very much for this excellent presentation, and I hope everybody is already convinced to use genomic assays to decide on neoadjuvant treatment. But let me ask you one question. So how many of you are using um, mamaprin and bupin in the neoadjuvant setting? Okay, well, so let's, uh, let's, um, let me ask you a question, and this is a, a clinical case. Um, well, mm. can we go back to the presentation? Okay. 
Okay, let me just go back to the end of the presentation. And let me ask you a clinical case to see what would you do in this case. Um, sorry for this. Okay, so this is a 54-year-old woman, postmenopausal, with a diagnosis of infiltrating breast cancer, no special type, 2.5 centimeter in size, ER 80%, PR 50%, HER2 negative, KI 67, 35%, no lymphovascular invasion, and one positive node um, in the axilla. So she's a clinical ET2 and 1M0. What treatment would you recommend? How many of you would do surgery up front? One, two, how many of you would give the patient neoadjuvant treatment? Three, four, okay. Neoadjuvant hormone therapy? Genomic profiling? To have more information? Okay, so what about the rest? You just send the patient to another hospital or to be treated? Because there is only like four or five answers to this. Okay, so what would you do? Genomic profiling, of course. <laughs> so why is that? Can you just give us a little bit more of that? Yeah, so she, um, she's postmenopausal. Um, she, has, she is in that gray area of patients that do or do not benefit from uh, chemotherapy, either neoadjuvant or adjuvant. Um, and I think for all the patients that we are still in doubt, we need to use genomic assays to have a more clear view of what type of tumor we are dealing with. Um, the only thing that stands out a little is that she has a KI 67 of 35%. Um, in our institute, that's debated sometimes whether we consider that high enough to give her chemotherapy anyways. Um, but still, we have never seen any evidence that uh, a genomic assay whatever genomic assay can, um, well, can be comparable to the KI-67. So I would go for the genomic profiling and see if we can treat her, downsize the tumor, downsize the axilla, hopefully, uh, to spare her um, extensive surgery. Yeah. yeah, because, you know, in this patient, you know, if you operate on her, and let's say that she had a 2.5, <coughs> 2.6 centimeter, more or less immunohistochemical is the same, um, only one lymph node positive. In many cases, postmenopausal, the medical oncologist will order a genomic platform to decide on chemotherapy because you know that this type of patients will go into this group of patients with, where if they are low risk, there is no benefit of, um, of any uh, chemotherapy. If low risk or low recurrence score, or whatever platform you use, genomic platform, you know, this patient could avoid chemotherapy. If you just give neoadjuvant chemotherapy on her, you are giving some treatment that she probably won't benefit from. So I think <coughs> this is clear. Clearly, one patient that you do in the core biopsy, the genomic platform, and you can decide if it's high risk, low risk, you can also have the blueprint and then give the treatment to her. Um, so, I hope this convinced you a little bit. 